I appreciate the chance to come down here and share a little bit. Uh, and the focus of the talk is product managers, product owners, which we'll see aren't quite exactly the same thing, and how we scale that up for large B2B infrastructure style projects uh, rather than the sort of typical small build me a website, build me an app kind of single team work. So let's dive right in. And uh, here's the one slide on me, of course, we need one of those. I've been working in Silicon Valley in B2B infrastructure since uh, steam powered computers. I started at HP way, way, way long ago writing COBOL for money, so I'm an ex-developer if there are such things. I go to the meetings. You know. And uh, most of my work these days is split between uh, large, you know, very large software companies trying to figure out the organizational problems of product management and product owner and uh, startups up in the city. I live in San Francisco, uh, working on the very earliest stages of ideas. I've been through five uh, B2B infrastructure startups around wireless and networking and intrusion detection. So uh, this is my core space. And uh, yeah, I, did, I ran the first product camps here, et cetera. Uh, and you can see the, the book up there for, for uh, guesses. Anybody know what this book is made of? Paper. Okay, well, you already have one of these, so you don't get one. Uh, it, there's, there's books out for the folks in the audience for right answers as we go along to keep things moving. Okay, perfect. So let's keep going. I had an agenda and really just three points to make, which I hope we'll do in about uh, 40 minutes or so and save some time for questions, particularly the remote folks at the end. And here's really the three points I wanted to make. The first is product owners and product managers kind of seem like the right thing, but we're going to draw them out in some more detail because they're deeply overlapped, but in my humble opinion, rather different in scope, rather different in depth, and we really need to tear them apart or we're going to end up with some confusion. Uh, the second thing is to paint out some of what I would call failure modes. So what does this look like when we have the wrong people doing the wrong things? or no one doing the wrong things. And then we'll build ourselves up with a couple of startup-sized organizational maps. So how do we think of a product owner, product manager in a company of 10 or a company of 50? And then we'll do a pretty extensive exercise that would look, I'm hoping, like some big releases you guys might be working on. I peeked in a little bit to 8.1 and some other things and stole some numbers. Hopefully this will ring true for some of the folks who are here. So there's the three points to make. Let's dive in and uh, you know, state some biases of mine. Product manager is clearly a job title. If you go out on any of the job sites, you can find here in the Valley 1,000 or 1,400 openings for product managers. We mostly know what those people are. We mostly know what those job descriptions are. If you take the same activity and you go to um, Dice or Craigslist or Monster, and you look up product owner, a really weird thing happens, which is almost no one hires product owners. We all pick them internally from our internal talent pools, and that leads to some very interesting opportunities and problems. So product owner here, and, and I think the Agile folks stress, is a role. It's not a title. It's not a job. It's something you do. So we're going to ask the question over and over again, well, who should be doing it in this situation and what skills do they need and what's the right combination? I'll take the position that there's no generic obvious answer where you reach into the org chart and you pull out everybody with the same title. Not working. Okay, so we'll look at skills, we'll look at scope. And the, the sort of small scale scrum model that says every Scrum team has eight plus or minus or seven plus or minus people and exactly one full-time product owner and exactly one, one full-time Scrum master I think is fine for small numbers of teams, but I haven't seen it work in the big scale. Right? So we'll, again, disassemble that and put it back together again because I think the small assumptions don't work when we scale them up. Okay, good. Um, and regardless of what we call ourselves and regardless of what name badge you wear or who you report to, the goal is to get the work done and the endless picking of, well, I'm a product manager, no, I'm a product owner, is only useful to the extent that we figure out what people we need doing what jobs and what roles and what activities and then we get on with the work of building and shipping product because um, here in the Valley, Real men and real women ship product. They don't just talk about shipping product. And either we're shipping product or we're all working someplace else soon. So we can't let titles get in the way of what we're doing, but we can't also wave away all of the 
skills and roles that might differentiate them. Okay, so uh, what does a product manager do? We'll do a couple of versions of this. Uh, for If you're at a revenue software company, the product manager does a lot of things, unfortunately. Uh, the two most important ones I see is um, not only driving delivery of bits of software of some little installable widget, but a whole product. So a whole product includes positioning and targeting and pricing and thoughtful help for the sales force as to who should be interested and competitive analysis and win-loss. And there's a lot of things that are not the bits because we know that if all you do is ship bits, what you don't have is product and what you don't have is revenue. So how do we think about delivery, not just engineering creation, and whole product, not just bits? And then the other thing that's critical for product managers to do is to think not about individual customers, but about segments. So which part of the large corporate infrastructure market are we targeting with this particular product? Who's going to buy it and why in mass quantities? Because if we're working on one-off features, we call that a body shop, right? And that's not a way to grow another $10 billion on Cisco's top line if we're thinking about individual customers. So if we let those two things go, all we're doing, honestly, is moving stories from here to there. All right, let's keep going. Um, here's a quiz, right? So this is a classic engineering I.O. diagram. So um, who can tell me? I'm going to put product management in the middle. Notice it's not at the top. Nobody works for product management. Um, and product management really has sort of three different constituents or stakeholders. We'll take engineering first because they're the obvious ones and you're here. So what's the stuff, what's the input that product management is supposed to provide to the engineering organization? Requirements. Requirements, good. So there's your book, right? Congratulations, right? And there's a lot of ways we can describe requirements. Value, so what exactly we should do. So let's hold that thought because when I think of requirements, there's an infinite number of words or phrases we can use to describe requirements depending on which model we're in or which religion we're practicing today and whether we call it priorities or backlogs and whether we call it requirements or MRDs or user stories and epics. Right? There's a long list of things we try to do our best to try to get our engineering brethren to understand what it is that we think should get built. Right? Priorities, yes. In fact, I think I have priorities up there. Good. Priorities are really important because if we're doing 10% of everything, we get nothing done. Right? Now, there's something on a good day we get back from the development team. What is it? No, it's not product. What is it? It's not feedback. Well, it is feedback, but that's really not. Sorry? It's pushback. We get a lot of pushback. Right. But there's a specific thing we're actually looking for to come back from the engineering organization. Reality check, you know, they're going to give that to us all the time. Resource. Schedules, resource. There are bits of product. Now, remember, it's not a whole product because it doesn't include a lot of things that product has to have, but it's at least the bits, the software, the hardware, the infrastructure, the stuff we ship, right? By the way, quiz, um, and if you're an engineer, don't answer, right? But uh, actually, if you're an engineer, this is for you. What, uh, how many of you know that you're smarter than the product manager on your team? Okay. <laughs> So you guys are being shy, because the answer is every engineer in this room and every engineer on the broadcast knows that they're smarter than the product manager on their team. That's going to be important in a minute, right? Um, for those of us who are humble. But what development delivers is not product. They deliver the bits that are going to go into the product that other people have to wrap other things around. Okay, so now, second part of the quiz. Product management has a bunch of things it's supposed to or wanted to give to marketing and sales. What are those things? Positioning is really good. In fact, there's the, there's the first answer. Positioning, what else? Pricing is really important because without pricing, we can't actually make any money. What else? Schedule, maybe. Market segmentation is really important. The schedule actually comes from whom? Engineering. So product management's passing it through and hoping it's not too far off, right? Because schedules only go one way, right? right? So there's a bunch of things, segmentation, messaging, features and benefits, more benefits than features, right? Pricing, qualification, demos, there's a bunch of things. Notice that nothing on the right is exactly equivalent to anything on the left. Okay? The things we give to engineering are not the things we give to sales and marketing. And the sales and marketing folks would treat us very, very badly if we tried to give them the raw bits and requirements because then they'd have to figure it out themselves. Good. What do we get back from the marketing and sales organization? 
Feedback, yes. And feedback's a key word for what? Reality check, yeah. Generally, feedback is in the form of what were you thinking, right? <laughs> I can't believe you didn't know that. Fill in the thing, right? Um, so there's our feedback, market feedback, right? By the way, if I, um, if I surveyed the Cisco sales force, anybody here in sales? Okay, I'm sure there'll be some folks on the telecast and sales here, but we'll, we'll pretend they're not. If I survey the Cisco sales organization, because I've done this with a lot of other sales organizations, there's one reason why we closed most of the big deals this quarter, and there's two reasons why we didn't close deals. Anybody know what the number one reason we closed deals this quarter was? Sorry? Salespeople, that's right. We have great salespeople. If you survey your sales force, you're going to be shocked to find out that your salespeople are great salespeople, right? Now, there's two reasons we lost deals this quarter. Good, yes. So here's a, why don't you pass that one back. And, sorry? Yeah, not so much. Price, yes. We charged too much and it didn't do what they wanted, right? Which are generally because, why do we get those three answers? Because product management's no good, and because uh, the sales force will generally report that if we closed the, the sale, it was because of their talent, and if we didn't close the sale, there's probably something wrong with the product or the price, um, because they're doing their job. So if we survey our sales force to find out what our customers want, what do we learn? Yeah, we learn that we have great salespeople. And that prices should be lower and we should have more features, right? Very useful directionally for our next round of roadmaps, right? Not so much. So one of the other things that product managers must, 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 must do is they have to reach over, around, through, and under the intervening sales and marketing and channel partners and everything else to actually talk to live customers and live prospects all the time to find out what's true out in the world because the filtering we get through however many layers there are here at Cisco is pretty dramatic, and you're not going to know what's true if it's fifth hand through the channel, right? And so if you are a product manager and you're not talking with customers, then everything you tell the engineering team is relatively suspect, right? And dependent on somebody else's point of view and somebody else's analysis. So, you know, the, one of the first things I check with when I parachute in on the occasion as an interim VP of product management when everything else has gone wrong for that company, is um, are they talking to actual customers, not the 15 steps along the way, right? Are we getting real data from the field? Are we doing win-loss analysis? Are we doing our own pricing, whatever? Okay, so there's one group left here. There's the executive team. What is the thing, what is the stuff that product management owes or is asked for from the executive team? Product roadmap, and, and why? Yeah, it's the what markets are we targeting that's the really important because what the executive team knows that there's nothing they can do that's really going to make any changes in the next one or two quarters, right? They're thinking in larger units of time, in larger units of dollars or whatever currency you're selling in. And so what they need to know is how are we going to take that next $700 million segment, right, which is all about futures and competitors and things like commitments and roadmaps and forecasts, what they really want to hear is what we should build next in the next 18 months that's going to get us nine figures worth of revenue, right? Um, what do we get back out of that meeting where, as product managers, we pitched our little hearts out about the next product to build? Budgets, that's exactly right. Here, last one. Um, we get budgets, right? And who is the budget for? Engineering, that's exactly right. We don't pitch on budgets to get more product management. We pitch budgets to beef up the development team to build the things we need. So we get back a yes or a no, and if it's a no, we try again. And if it's yes, we get back some budgets for engineering, right? some staffing, and some targets. What are the targets we get back? It's whatever we pitched, right? So I came in and said, I think there's a $450 million market here. Guess what my target is? You bet, right? But by the way, it's six months shorter. Okay, so the reason to draw this in such painful detail is because if you sit in the product management chair, and you don't get to sit very often, as you pace near your cube, you actually have to be trilingual, right? You have to be able to talk to the engineering organization in its own language, 
in specs and MRDs and stories and stuff they understand. You have to be able to talk out through the sales and marketing and channel and customer side in customer relevant, useful benefit statements with value attached. And you have to be able to talk about the future in financial terms. And so the essential product management thing is to be able to form a three-part sentence where you say, I know or believe or bet my job on the fact that customers really want this and we can build it and they're going to pay us enough for it that it's going to justify the massive expense, right? If you don't have those three things in a sentence, then your product managementness is suspect, right? Um, that's really important because we're going to break this down a couple of other ways when we get to product owner. Let's keep going. Okay, so um, the other thing about product management is when we're on the engineering side of the house, we would love to believe that everyone in the company is purely rational, makes absolute decisions based on the numbers, has no local agenda, sees the facts the same way we are, and the way to win an argument is simply to prove that we're the smartest people at the table with the best numbers, right? I'd love to live in that company in that world, but we don't, okay? The nature of big companies is that we have a lot of folks lobbying for the thing they need locally. Sales reps get paid not to support the company strategy, but to close the big deal, which needs two little special things that nobody else needs, right? And sales reps who are great at convincing people of things, because that's why we hired them, and who don't get paid until they close that deal, will do every reasonable and unreasonable thing to go up and down the organizational chart to get you, the product manager, to give them the two features which only that customer needs. And explaining that you're not going to do it doesn't satisfy them, right? So we live in a system where it's not enough to be right. You also have to be persuasive and have some good political skills and be humble and occasionally go out for drinks with the sales reps, right? It's not sufficient to be right. It's required that you understand how decisions are made and you influence the process. If that's something that's distasteful to you, then we'll see product owner may be a good fit, but product manager not so much, okay? Got to keep things rolling. All right, finally, um, let's talk just briefly about when we go out in the market. The market actually has a definition for what product managers are. And when you read job descriptions, this is what companies like Cisco hire when they go out to hire product managers, right? They all want existing product managers with existing experience, right? Um, they all want somebody who's a great communicator. They all want somebody with a, ideally a technical undergraduate degree, an MBA would be nice, and everybody wants expertise in their tiny, tiny, narrow slice. You're working on hardware-supported encryption. We really want a product manager who's already worked on hardware-supported encryption. Why do we have a picture of a unicorn here? They're very, very rare. They may be out there. And so we've all sort of over, overcharged our job descriptions such that we never actually find this person. And I'd strongly suggest the things that matter the most are the first two, which is you've done the job and it didn't kill you and you still want to do it for reasons that nobody understands, right? And that you can deal with lots of folks in, in throughout the organization. If you instead pick people who are subject matter experts and know more in the world than anyone else about hardware supported encryption, you don't get a product manager, you get a subject expert, right? But this is what the Valley says when they say product manager. This is what it means. Okay, let's keep going. All right, um, everybody's been through the scrum description. All right, we're about to change over here from product manager to product owner. So this is just a little build and let's do the build, right? So. Ideally, you have a charter or a goal before you put the engineers on the team, right? And you build a product backlog with your hopes and dreams for the next 30 years, and you do some release planning, and then you build a release backlog with features and stories, and then you do some sprint planning and some sprint backlog and some stand-ups and some accepting stories, and here's our end of sprint review, and here's our stack of releasable software, and there's our software release, right? So this is the if you think of it as the manufacturing process, we're going to see different pieces of this fall to product owners and product managers. Okay, let's keep going. All right. Um, oh, there's our retrospective. Good. All right, so let's unpack this the same way. What does a product owner do? And I'm going to use that as a key phrase as written in the Scrum books. Right? Go get Ken Schwaber's book or whoever it is, and you'll see this. Right? And I put a couple of things in bold. 
Why did I put the customers in bold? Anybody? Who's paying for it? Who's buying it, right? More importantly, it's always a singular in the Scrum books. All the Scrum books start with the assumption that some one person in the universe is the great godly customer who we can bring our little things to and have them check our work, right? And if you're building an accounting system for inside the company and the CFO delegates somebody and says, that's who's going to be your customer and approver, you have a person you can go to and say, did we get it right? Okay. By definition, if you're in a market with lots of segments, there is no one single customer that represents your market, and you therefore must apply judgment that the Scrum model doesn't assume you have to have. Okay, the other thing I put in bold, at any time, it's critical, right? Every book says the product owner must be with the team all the time in every stand-up, in every Scrum meeting, in every plan, right? Which is critical and important and necessary. What's my beef with this? You're not, right? If you are with the team all the time, you may be talking to customers on the phone sometimes, but you're sure not out there rubbing elbows with what's happening in the world. So when we start with the definition, we're already in a problem because the product owner should know all things and be omniscient, right? But isn't allowed out of the building. Okay. Intense sprint level stories and backlogs and prioritization, right? It's in the mechanics of the thing. One per team, maybe not so much. Uh, one of the things that we usually miss this is what engineers want from product management. They want somebody who's there all the time, who answers all the questions, who writes all the stories, who's one of their comrades, who's gone native. And this is good. This is great. One of the reasons Agile delivers better and more is because we're finally putting enough product ownership and product management with the team when they need it. Nothing worse than a bunch of engineers who come back to me and say, well, our product manager was off on some road trip for February. So we built the things we thought we should build, right? Fail. So being there is really important, and it's what the team wants, and it's what they love. And so as product managers, honestly, we get such adulation from our teams that we do this. We stay in the building and we never leave, right? And the last, and we'll see a picture, I'm going to call it feeding the hungry beast. Actually, I think I have a picture here, so let's do this. So um, if anybody remembers the age of steam trains, anybody old enough, right? Right. Um, there was a particular job, right? There was a person on the train whose, whose name was, what was the job called? No. Sorry? Coleman, right. There's another name for it. They called him the fireman, right? And the fireman is the person who holds the shovel and stands behind the engine in the mountain of coal and shovels coal, right? Why does he shovel coal? To feed the hungry beast in order to... Move the train, right? What happens when you stop shoveling coal? The train slows down and eventually stops, right? So the fireman is the person who is constantly shoveling coal into the engine because when he stops, things stop, right? The product owner is the person who must be on site with the team all the time working on stories and acceptance and, sorry? Right, priorities and is it done and right? All those things. Because if that product owner is not there, the train stops. By the way, who, who drives the train in these trains? The engineer drives it. Okay, that's fine. All right, let's keep going. So now when we draw that same chart, remember this chart? And we say, what does the narrowly defined product owner do? He does this. He, she, works the backlog, right? Checks the product bits and talks to, generally they talk about two showcase customers. Do you guys have showcase customers? Okay, They're the two customers that love you so much that they're willing to send somebody into your scrum team every other week to look at what you've done, right? Which is great, but it's not representative. If you think those two showcase customers represent your market, then you're an engineer, right? Okay, um, the product owner is doing something critical and important and necessary to keep the agile process going, and without that product owner, it all falls apart. But it's not sufficient, okay? Necessary but not sufficient. Let's keep going. Okay, so when I take the same chart and I say, the product owner is feeding the middle part of this loop. This is the inner loop. This is the every single day. This is the stand up in the story. And the product owner is shoveling coal like crazy here, right? But is missing time to do some other things on the outside. For instance, 
product strategy and pricing and competitive and is this the right product, right? And the product manager who can't possibly cover this whole thing, but we'll see in some cases does anyway, has a sort of different overlap, which is how do I get the edges of this so we're building the right product that's going to make money and find customers, um, but it's really hard to do the inner loop too because it's so consuming, right? So between the product manager and the product owner, somehow we have to fill this space, but um, you've got a pretty short lifetime if you're doing this whole job. Let's keep going. All right, so the way I usually describe that is that the product manager has more levers. There's our little mixing board for those who remember analog. Um, the, the, the pure engineering output really is the things that product owners focus on, right? What's the priority of the work? Which story are we doing next? Is it well specced? And that's how we get the product bits out of engineering, which by the way, if we don't get the product bits, nothing to sell, right? But the product manager has a much larger scope. How are we going to sell it and who are the channels and what's the competition and segmentation, right? Notice by definition, if I have a much bigger scope, I can't be as deep on the things that somebody with narrower scope has, right? So product owner is deep, deep, deep focus on the two core engineering deliverables, right? And the product manager is spread peanut buttered over a, a larger sector, right? Um, we're still, okay. So now let's talk about the failure modes. I painted the problem, right? Which is we have a lot to do. In fact, we have, by my estimation, 60% more product management to do under Agile than we had under Waterfall, okay? So if you look at your product management team and don't notice a 60% increase in staff, we're going to have a problem which we're gonna have to address, okay? So now let's look at the failure modes. Um, we're gonna stay on our transportation theme, I think, right? So um, if I look at product management teams that are in the depths, in the, in the heat of battle on going agile, what I see is this. Um, they're already understaffed, there's significantly more work to do under Agile than they had under Waterfall. We get better results. We're happier. We make more money. We ship products faster. But it creates more work for the product management team. And the urgency of the product owner stuff drives our every waking moment, right? And some of the, if you've got teams in all the different time zones, there are no other than waking moments, right? I'm up all night on the phone. Um, and the stuff that is most urgent pulls us away from the things that are strategic, right? Um, now, I've done the full job, the all product manager and all product owner thing for one scrum team, and I could do it, and I think there are a lot of people who can do it. That's about a 10 to one ratio, okay? If I look at your organization, and I was trying to pull some numbers, I think you're at about 35 to one if you do product managers to engineering staff or higher in some instances, okay? So 35 to one is not a sustainable pace you can't do it, it doesn't work, you fail. Even the best of us fail. So again, your product managers are generally people who don't complain so much and step up and try to be heroic. And then they get burnt out and they either do something else or they quit, right? So let's keep going. Um, how do we think about product owners, right? Here we go, I had to do this, sorry. Um, when I go to engineering organizations, I ask them how they want to pick product owners because we decided, of course, that product owners report to engineering. They're picked out of engineering and you guys get to choose, right? So here's what development organizations tell me they want in their product owners, okay? We want subject matter experts, lots of technical chops. They better know how to code or they're not allowed to sit with our engineers, right? They got to write a lot of stories and they should already know our market, okay? If we're working on, you know, telepresence, well, let's get somebody who already knows telepresence. Why? because then, then we don't have to send them out to talk to customers, right? That ages really fast because generally the market changes, right? Uh, we rarely have engineering and, and development organizations that are asking for the market side skills, right? Um, they don't understand that a lot of what product managers do is hold back those sales reps with the really weird requests all day long. And so you get product owners who, have, who feel like they have to evaluate every request, no matter how stupid or random, right? And uh, they believe in a world where customers evaluate products strictly on the specs and they buy the best one based on some price value ratio because we're all rational engineers, aren't we, right? Again, I would love to sell in that world, but that's not how selling works. So what we end up with is we end up with product owners that tend to slant toward the more technical customers, the more technical users, and the technical details at the expense of the broad segment. 
Sometimes we get great ones and we're thrilled, but that's okay. All right, so um, what's the failure mode? Uh, product manager failure mode here, of course, is as the product manager, I'm not there, I'm part-time, I'm sort of engaged. Who's got an engineering team who's seeing this in their product manager, right? Almost all of them, right? Um, the backlog's stale, I do a lot of hand-waving. If you ever hear the phrase, build what I meant, it means I either didn't understand what I wanted or I didn't have the time or I was too lazy or I was closing deals. So you guys are smart, figure it out, right? We're in transportation, right? So we need a transportation analogy. Here's our train wreck, okay? Your product managers are going to fail if we simply say, you got 60% more work, suck it up, right? Now let's look at the product owner failure mode. By the way, why do we have this picture here? That's right. Under Agile, we're going to get a lot done faster. So instead of a train wreck, we're going to have a disaster that's faster. In this case, it's an airplane, right? And here's the product owner generic failure, right? I've got somebody who doesn't really understand how markets work. How does selling happen and how do pricing happen and why don't customers want to upgrade and discounting and all this stuff, right? I've got somebody who doesn't know anybody in marketing or sales or support. Right? I've got somebody who doesn't really care about the company strategy is making local trade-offs right? and who believes the showcase customers are typical. Again, I'm overgeneralizing, but if we pick engineering-oriented product owners without any support from product management and we simply tap them on the shoulder and make them product owners, this is what we get right? because our engineering teams are picking folks that are more like them and less like product managers. And I don't know why anybody would want to be a product manager. I've been in it a while and haven't figured it out. But they're different from our engineering friends. And so we really want to not ignore that. OK, let's keep going. So there's the problem. We've got too much to do. We've got very technical product owners. We've got product managers stretched too thin who aren't giving the Agile teams what they need. Let's build up some solutions. OK? Uh, and we'll start small because I spend about half my time with startups because that's easier. All right, um, here's a, a map we're going to draw a bunch of versions of. So management goes higher up is more into management, right? And we're going to say if you're on the left side, you're more technical. And if you're on the right side, you're more market focused. And I'm going to also color code those red for more technical and blue for more market. In a startup, actually there are no product managers, but when a startup gets to about 18 or 25 people, they find they can't live anymore without a product manager and they hire one because everything's communication-wise is falling apart. And they only get one, because you've got to start somewhere. And so we have one person who's trying to do this whole job. I call it heroic. What happens to the Greek heroes at the end of all those? Anyway, it's not, it's not pretty. But we have one person who heroically steps in and says, I am going to do all possible things that product management and product ownership want, because it must get done, and that's how our startup's going to survive. And if we live to be 50 people, we'll deal with the problem later. OK. Um, so let, let's take the next choice. Let's take this one. This is the classically dysfunctional choice because they're separated. There's no communication between our product manager and our product owner. Right? This is the worst of all possible things because they're either not in the same city or they're sniping at each other or their bosses don't agree. Right? Um, if you have this, you might as well go home because your product owners are going to build the thing they'd like customers to want. And your product managers are going to go out and sell the thing they'd like engineering to have been building. Right? And we all know where the story ends. OK, so next choice. If we get a little bigger and we scale up a little bit, um, this is a sort of peering model. We've got one person who plays sort of product strategist. And we have a series of people who've carved up the product set into smaller pieces. But they're all doing the whole job. Right? So don't care if you call you product manager or product owner or Jeffrey, right? whatever your name is doesn't matter, but you're covering the entire rack of requirements and markets end to end for your piece of the product set. And that works as long as there's somebody who's really the coordinating strategist here and makes sure the pieces fit together. Otherwise, you rapidly get a three product company with three different markets and three different pricing strategies and three different segments and three different channels. And then you all get to work at another company. Right? Okay. Another way to slice this for the small company is to say, we're going to have some senior people, and I'm going to call them product managers, because I generally look for people with lots more market experience. And I'm going to have some more potentially junior po people, usually pulled out of 
engineering or sales engineers or TMEs or some other groups with good technical chops who, honestly, I hope I could grow them into the product manager description later on, but right now they're product owners. And I pair them up or triple them up or whatever, so I have teams where someone provides the market input and somebody else provides the product ownership. Right? This is heavily dependent on who you've got and what they're good at. There's no perfect solution. There's no cookie cutter chart here. Right? But notice we're still in a small scale. Right? So with the nine minutes we've got left, let's try to build up something bigger. Right? So let's imagine a 90 person project. I think you guys have some of that size, right? And again, this is generic, and I'm going to say our 90 people make up eight scrum teams, okay, whatever, right? And every scrum team, according to the book, has a scrum master and a product owner and a team, undifferentiated, and any work can go to any of those folks, and this is what it looks like, right? And by the way, there's one product manager who's supposed to orchestrate this whole thing, right? Doesn't scale up so well. So let's... Um, Let's ask the question of, we should probably have these teams be specialized, right? When we set up our scrum teams, we didn't say random people, random work, take any piece of work you want. We probably put them into some logical organization. So let's imagine this particular one, and let's say uh, over here, we've got a couple of what I would call headline features. Customers are going to see them. Gartner is going to want them in your matrix. They're the ones that go on the headline on the press release if you do one. They're the, at the top of the data sheet. Those are the things that are on the three bullets, right? What do we know about the bullets we write as product managers for marketing, right? No more than three bullets, no more than eight words per bullet, right? Um, I get to say that. I've run marketing groups. Um, there's some headline features which are very visible to the customers, right? But there's a bunch of other stuff going on in the hood. Um, I've been working with an Alameda company that does uh, virtual operating systems. Can't tell you their name. Um, but one of the projects we're working on needs a tremendous amount of performance improvement. In fact, they happen, that particular group has four entire scrum teams that are working on performance tuning. And they're doing interleaved I.O. and they're doing microcode optimization, all these things I don't understand, right? But there's a whole team on our product that's doing performance optimization. Okay, what else are we going to have? Um, we're going to have a UI UX team that's doing UI UX. And in this particular one, let's say we have a whole bunch of drivers and connectors and third-party inputs and APIs and right, the SAP hook and the Ariba hook and the, right. There's, there's an infinite number of customers want to connect things to here. And so there's two whole teams that are working on drivers and connectors and stuff, right? So now, now we get to ask the question of who do we want for the product owners? Okay. Now we have a context. Now we have a way to attack this. So let's erase all the product owners as generic. They're gone. Right? And let's ask the question of who do we want for the product owners? Okay? And I think let's start, I think we started in the performance side. One of our generic product managers is the person who's going to write every single user story for how we're going to optimize performance on this product. Probably not. Who's a good candidate for somebody to be a product owner here? Sorry? Tech lead and SME. I wrote it down as a couple of performance architects, right? We need people who know the inside and out of performance here. And honestly, a product manager who just wanders in off the street um, doesn't last very long in these meetings. We need some folks here who can really drive at the story level, at the technical level, at the approval level, at the what is it done, did we run the test, are we asking the right questions level, right? Because otherwise, we don't get performance improvement. Right? Let's, um, let's ask the question about uh, UI UX. Who do we want for a product owner? Sorry? No, I don't think you want marketing or sales. I think you probably want somebody who knows something about UX, right? Now, it might be your product manager. Maybe you've got some product managers who are deep UX, UI folks, and that's great. But on average, if you have a team that's doing UX and UI, they would probably be happier with somebody who's giving them direction who knows what they're doing, right? Now, let's take the headline features. Who do we want for the product owner on the headline features? I think you do. I think you do. I think this is going to be very visible. It's going to have a lot of messaging. It's going to have a lot of, does it really do what the markets and the competitors want? I want a product manager. Now, maybe there's two. I don't know, right? I don't know how much the work is. But that smells like product management to me. OK, we've got one group left down here for drivers and connectors. Product owner should be? 
engineering maybe? Yeah, I actually thought I might put a TMA here, but it sure depends on who it is, right? It's somebody who understands what customers are going to do with the stuff, has the details, could be an engineering lead, right? Notice the question marks are because I can't give you a generic answer and say it is always true that the right person on this side is a performance architect, right? Uh -uh, it doesn't work that way. Okay. And the way, and by the way, the other thing we have to do here is we have to make sure these five or six or seven people get together all the time. So that's probably a daily sit down or call or get together and you know, they are intensely working together all the time because that's your product team. And if they're building the wrong things, you end up with the wrong things. So this can't be a gentle dotted line, I'll let you know when we're finished with Sprint 6. This is serious, committed, working together, sitting together, getting on the telepresence together, everyday people with strong lines between them because otherwise we have the same old exploded, broken, various engineering groups not coordinated, right? We okay so far? So there's one more step to do here, which is let's take a, just to show that this isn't generic, let's take a logical left shift, right? And let's look at the wrong product owners. And I think I'm going to start, but I'm trying to remember, I think I started by saying, let's move the product manager over to be in charge of all the performance work, okay? Not so good, right? And then let's logical left move the performance architect over to be in charge of the drivers of the connectors. Not so happy, right? And then let's take our TME and move them over to work on the UI UX. Don't know, could be good at that, right? And let's take our UX person and put her in charge of top line features. Maybe not, maybe, depends who they are. But notice if we take the same people in the same roles and we rotate them all one place, we end up with a train wreck or an airplane crash if we're faster here, right? The important thing is these are not generic assignments. These are not one size fits all. This is not Let's pick everybody with the following title and turn them into product owners. The other is we need them full time, right? If you're the performance architect, we can't have you also managing and running the team. Okay, so the, the point here is uh, we have to think about each team and organization and figure out what they need and then put somebody in place. Okay, keep going. Um, so, and I'll just click through the rest of this. Um, I would claim that there isn't a generic answer here. We know we need product owners and we know we need product managers. To say product managers will do all the product owner work is at this scale a failed model. To say suck it up and just work twice as hard, not a long-term strategy. To say we're going to tap engineering managers uniformly and make them product owners. It's a fit sometimes, mostly it's not, right? We have to look at the problem. Uh, we have to look at what the team's working on and the, and the skills mix. And we have to actually have people who take these jobs on. I go to a lot of places where the product owner is somebody who actually has a completely different job and is allocated 5 or 10 or 15% to do this stuff on the side. Not good, especially, by the way, if that's a TME who's out in the field, right, trying to close deals, right? You can't be a product owner with one or two teams. Remote 10% doesn't work. So we have to allocate folks. Now, there's some politics here which I won't get involved in, which is so who do we recruit and where do we get the headcount, right? And we'll all fight about that for the next year, but someone has to be the product owner for that team. And the answer can't be a little of this, a little of that, and some borrowing. So we must solve this problem by actually assigning names to boxes, right? Uh, strong dotted line, lots of discussion. I think I've got one more point here, right? Regardless of how we do this, Product management still owns shipping real good product that is whole, that works that customers want, and that delivers revenue, and that's competitive. So no matter how we slice this, we don't, as product managers, get to say, well, the product owners didn't give me what they wanted, and we didn't meet, and I'm really unhappy, right? Product management owns the problem and gets to delegate, and so you have to have very explicit discussions about, well, I'm going to ride along with you for the first sprint or two to see what kind of decisions you make and build some trust, right? And then once I see it's all good, I'll back off. And if we get into trouble, I'll pull back in. And by the way, if you, product owner, run into an issue that you think I should know about, raise your hand, send an email, pick up the phone, come knock on my door, right? Because we can't have this. We can't have lack of responsibility. We can't have somebody else's job. Product management owns the problem, but gets to delegate to product owners pieces of the problem that are mutually agreed upon, right? 
You don't get to walk away and say, you know, Daddy and the EVP told us this was a good idea and I don't have any responsibility for building the right thing. Not allowed. Okay, so um, getting to the couple of takeaways here, right? So we've got to have product owners. If we're going to do this whole Agile Scrum thing, as you guys have deeply committed to doing, it doesn't work unless they're product owners. So let's stand up and figure out who they are. Um, not a sideline, not an add-on, not an afterthought, not a 10%. Actual people doing the work. It would be really cool, by the way, if we get them together and train them and maybe even have them be in the same group and share. Let me know, right? Um, product managers aren't, can't be the default for every single product owner and every single team. The numbers don't work and the skills don't work, right? So we need to think about and plan and decide and choose who our product owners are going to be or it doesn't work, right? So that's people sitting around with actual names of individuals that they know trying to piece it together and then levering those folks out of their current job to do the new job, right? No cookie cutter, okay? So I think that's the end of the rant. Um, this is how to find me. Um, by the way, anybody who didn't get a book and anybody who's on the, the, um, the TV link, if you want a soft copy of the book, just drop me an email or a LinkedIn or whatever. Um, I was lucky enough to buy my name as a domain name back when nobody was buying domain names. Good. So we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Um, and let's take one here. And then I think there's some audio link for folks who are, let's start there. So for those of you who are in, um, in the audience, please raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. Good. And anybody on the remote link would love to get that feedback as well. Michael, first. <coughs> you talked about all the product owners collaborating and everybody dotting line to the product management. But in, in a scrum team, there is a defined procedure. You go through your um, daily what you did, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and what are you suggesting for these product owner groups to look at and what, what are they supposed to be debating, brainstorming? So, uh, you know, one model is in fact, a question. one model is to say that there's a separate stand up for all the product owners and product managers in 15 minutes. That could work. Uh, if they sit together, you know, maybe there's some other model. Uh, the most important thing is that there's some very rapid communicating, depending on geography here. So let's imagine, for instance, there's a daily product stand up sometime a few hours away from the engineering stand up because we want to have all the follow on issues right after the core stand up. Um, but what we're doing is we're checking in on product decisions that we're making because what happens is I make a bunch of local decisions because they're mine to make and they don't line up with the strategy that the other folks are working on. And so what we're trying to do is not so much handle scheduling and work, we're trying to organize decisions. Wendy? Can you talk a little bit more about the thought process behind PO assignment? Sure. And what you would need from a, say, project description or scope to find that right PO. Yeah. So um, I usually think this is a side effect of having thoughtfully organized scrum teams, because if you don't, there's no place to start. And then probably looking at the medium-sized stories or mini epics or whatever they are and trying to figure out who's going to know what those answers are. Uh, and, and generally, for me, that helps you get some fallout that says, well, who's going to know these things or who's going to be good at these things um, and can do it? Because the, the product management failure here is we put a product manager on there who, for instance, um, knows what good performance is. It's 30% faster, but couldn't spell interleaved I.O. if you gave them all the vowels, right? So I think we, we look at that work when we're creating those teams. We say, well, what are, what's the locus of content of that team? And that should lead us to a good description of who we need. Anybody on the phones? How do we do this? I'll go ahead and um, take an online question. Okay. Does a product backlog have, a new feature, have new features only or bug defects as well? Uh -huh. How does a product manager prioritize backlog, which has a mixture of new features and defects? Which gets priority? Right. So I, I've used a bunch of different techniques to blend the bug backlog and the feature backlog. Um, let me give you a couple or three different choices. So for instance, we might say there's a budgeting process. And every sprint, we're going to spend 
15% of our points fixing bugs, right? And maybe my test lead is the person who gets to pick which bugs they are, because honestly, we're going to take the hottest one first, and we're going to fix as many as we can. Um, I try to avoid having the teams get interrupted with P2, P3 bugs. If there's a P0 system down, we all stop. Um, usually it's pretty obvious, but the budgeting model means we don't have to battle among ourselves and we're not running up so much technical debt. Uh, another alternative is to do a bug fix sprint every third sprint. I mean, it really depends on the quality of the product and the degree of automated testing. But we, we know we're doing the wrong thing when anyone says, let's just work on features this sprint because we can always fix bugs next sprint, right? That's equivalent to the seven-year-old who tells you at dinner, I'd really like to have dessert first tonight, but I promise tomorrow night I'll eat dinner in the right order of vegetables first. We know where this ends up. You don't want to be there. Um, we've got to work on quality every single day, every single release, or, well, we end up in bad places. Okay. Um, so in organizations which are in zero-sum zero, zero game situations, yes. so there's no growth. It's the team is the team, and the size is the size. And we want to move to Agile. Now, we okay. acknowledge and we understand that there are new roles. There are Scrum Masters, Architects, sure. Product Owners. Uh, from engineering, I think we are making the decision quite easily. We just say, you know, today, please spend half of your time Scrum Masters for the next six, nine months. Okay. We understand you will code a little bit less. Right. Uh -huh. What can we offer to product marketing teams so that they can do Product owner work. Is there something that they do today and they must do today, but uh, tomorrow oh. working with Agile, they may not, maybe. Right, so the question not is do. what can we throw under the bus or out of the boat that we don't have to do anymore because we're Agile? Which right? will make sense. And, and the answer is no. The answer is the things we have to do to sell product still are there. We still must position and describe and have features and meet with customers and do the executive briefing center things and go out and close deals and wrestle with the pricing folks and get product numbers assigned. None of that goes away. So our choices are to say, we're going to pretend this isn't true. We're going to um, build fewer products. We're going to pull people from another place. Um, you know, this is a law of gravity problem, right? And the answer is we have to find a way to do it or we fail. And uh, when I've seen the product management team shifted hard, I guess for you it's what, logical left, right, over to engineering, six months later we're in a revenue crisis because we've stopped doing the things that are necessary outside of engineering that generate money. And we've once again fallen into the confusion that product bits are product. So, you know, that's not an answer other than to say, the big kids who wear the big badges have to sit around the table and figure out what we're going to do because pretending it's not a problem isn't a good option over the long term. Good. Uh, why don't we is there somebody else on the line? No. We'll go ahead with in-room first and then okay, I'll go good. back to online. All right, over here. Okay, yeah, I was just curious. I know a lot of companies have already gone down this road. Yes. How are they able to scale with this process? You know, what are the learnings that we could perhaps... So I think, uh, you know, a good learning here is that um, our narrow definition of product manager is narrow and that there's a breadth of talent there. If you go back to some of the product management training from the 90s, they usually described two or three roles. You had a product marketing-ish person and a sort of technical facing product manager and a strategist, right? There's a lot of ways to cut the problem. Um, that's a good one. We have to put together teams, right? A lot of the, um, the, the lean UX folks talk about a team of a UX person and an architect and a product manager as the right collection of people to go out to the world and learn things because they hear different stuff, right? What we have to do is we have to recognize that Agile needs a different structure and that if we simply move the pieces around, what we have is we have smaller waterfalls and the same failure of lack of product input, right? And so we're, we're going to have to do a little less in the short term. But the goal here, by the way, is that when we move to an agile model, we get a lot more done over time, right? So next year, we're getting 30 or 40 or 50% more done. And so the engineering team was able to absorb that. Right? Um, the failure mode here is we're, we're building the wrong thing twice as fast as we used to because we've accelerated the big portion, which is engineering. Good. One more? 
So you said something very interesting. You said oh, people, good. I'm glad. <laughs> you said people hire product managers and people hire product engineers. Oh, sorry, engineers, but you don't see people hiring product owners. I don't. I don't. I'm surprised. So the model you described, have you seen engineers or designers or performance architects step up to be product owners? Yes. And I think there's a lot of folks in those various jobs and other ones who either want to be or are showing the right characteristics to be. We have one here. Good, thank you. Um, I would contend that if you look at the sort of skills and style matrix kind of stuff, product owners are different from engineers in a lot of subtle ways. And generally when I'm sitting with a bunch of engineering folks, I can smell who the, the likely product managers are, right? And those are the folks I really want. And it's not a title-driven thing. It's the folks who ask good customer questions. It's the ones who want to go on the ride-alongs and get out there. It's the ones who stop by support every once in a while to find out what's really broken in the product. Right? There's a bunch of characteristics of people who are deeply technical but either want to be or look like product owners. And if we're doing a good job, we're finding those folks and you know, moving them to a place where they have a chance to try a new shape job. If they don't like it, they can always move back. But honestly, I do my best recruiting for the classic product manager jobs out of folks who become product owners, because they're just what I want, right? And that's a continuum of skills and talents. They have better people skills. They have better listening skills. They're, they're good at um, letting somebody else finish the argument and then bring it back to the point that we're going to settle on, right? There's a lot of skills issues here about product owners that aren't the ones they train you in your CS courses. But a lot of you as engineers know what they are, and you're good, smart, broad people and can step into that. Um, but yeah, pulling TMEs or sales engineers, uh, occasionally a program project manager, but not so much. Uh, sometimes a lead support person, uh, test leads, whatever. They're out there. We know they're out there. Okay. One more? Yeah, so two things. One is uh, in, the, in the companies that have gone through this transformation, what is a career roadmap for a product owner? That's number one. Number two, in a self-organizing model of Agile, uh, let's say, for whatever reason, you know, the one piece or one user story failed, you know. In classic today's model, we go to a DE manager, a test manager, say, you guys shape up, you guys do whatever it takes, and then go, for, you know, because we have to deliver, right. time is not going to move out. In this model, who takes the hit and who goes and, and basically pushes this uh, entire team around? To, to get going. You can say the answer is the team, but the team's in this case right. not happening. So, so, so then, uh, let me, because you asked really three questions, and I'll try to get them in real quick order because we're almost out of time. Um, career path, you know, product managers get to be senior product managers, director of product managers, and then they mostly top out, and they either decide they're going to run engineering organizations, or they're going to run marketing organizations, or they're going to do something else like run a support team, because there's not a, the latter usually ends at director and junior VP. but. It's a good ladder, and some of us have been on it. Um, as far as self-organizing teams, I think, I guess I'm agnostic here. I'm not sure I really believe in self-organizing teams to the extent that there's a business goal here, and it's not enough for the team to decide they don't like that goal. Shape up, we're paying you to build product, right? And they get to self-organize within a scope, but they don't get to throw pieces of work out because they don't want to do them, and they don't get to decide they want to change markets and segments and pricing and packaging. So um, I think a lot of the where do we solve the it's late problem usually fall to the scrum of scrum folks. Because I would say scrum masters and project program managers are the people who really know how to move the boxes around of what we're building and where the, where the efficiencies are. The product management question is not that. The product management question is since we're running late, and yes, we're running late, we're always running late, which of the five must-have features are we not going to ship, right? The, the product management question is that. Okay, I know we all agreed that the MVP had to have these 11 things, but it's today. Are we delaying or are we dropping number 11? Right? That's the product management question, and I would really hope that our team gets together and argues that and throws food and wrestles around the table to figure out which of the 11 things we're simply not going to have and which customers are going to be on the phone tomorrow morning because we promised it to them, right? That's the product management challenge. Uh, do we have time for one I have more? the final question Good. online. Okay, perfect. What is your advice for distributed teams? If the project manager is in a different location from the rest of the team, how does the product owner participate in a scrum meeting? 
Yeah, that's really hard. So we should all acknowledge that distributed teams are much harder and much less efficient and much less productive than when we put the teams together. So whenever we form a distributed team, we better acknowledge that there's a big cost here. If the product owner, uh, I would always put the product owner in the same geography as the product team if I can. If they're really distributed, then the product owner is going to be up all night and up all morning and on all these phone calls. It's really hard. So, um, you know, that's just acknowledging there's lots of, you guys build lots of good tools to reach out across the world, but there's nothing like leaning over to the desk of the person next to you. There's nothing like sharing meals with the folks on your team. Uh, if you have a distributed team, you should once a quarter fly them all to the same place for a week and have them work together because that'll get you 20% more throughput. And everything else is, I think, on the margin less important than trust and face-to-face -face communication and good division of labor and not letting the developers say that it's the tester's problem and vice versa. All right, I think we're out of time. So let's break. Do we do anything to uh, close this out? All right, thanks, everybody.